Download our complimentary guidebooks, checklists, and other useful financial resources at savantwealth.com slash guides. Welcome to today's Savant Live webinar. My name is Joel Kundick. I'm a financial advisor in Savant's Vienna, Virginia office. And joining me today is Elena Davalos. Uh, she's a wealth transfer advisor in our Atlanta office and a recovering probate attorney. Uh, good to have you with me today, Elena. Thank you, Joel. You know, as you mentioned before joining Savant, I was a practicing attorney and I've represented many, many executors. So I'm glad to be joining you guys today to talk about this important topic. I know we're going to have a lot of questions. We have a lot of people attending today and uh, feel free to post the questions that you have in the Q&A uh, menu up top. If we don't get to your question while we're talking today, we'll be sure to have someone reach out to you individually afterwards to answer whatever question that you pose, okay? So I'm gonna launch things off. We're talking about serving as an executor, which is a pretty broad topic, but in order to properly frame being an executor, we've also got to talk about what happens in the course of an estate plan, how you build an estate plan, uh, what are your options in creating it, and then what roles is this person who's going to serve as your executor going to take in helping you out. So uh, we'll start out with, with a, a pretty uh, commonly asked question, which is what is an executor and what is a trustee? So you're, you're, when you're working to manage an estate and to build an estate plan, you have competing objectives in some ways. You're trying to make sure that your heirs, number one, appreciate what you've preserved and, and put forward to them, but also uh, that they don't spend it inappropriately. Sometimes receiving a, 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 an inheritance can feel a little bit like winning the lottery, actually, in, in terms of the behaviors of recipients. So you want to make sure you're leaving it in a way that's going to be most likely to um, be to the benefit of your heirs. But you're also trying to preserve independence. So you want them to be able to make uh, decisions on how to manage. Sometimes we're going to have competing issues of in income and estate taxes uh, that we have to be aware of different thresholds that are going to be uh, uh, at play, and we'll talk about those later. And at the end of the day, if at all possible, we want to be able to preserve family harmony. Uh, and and I, I would say just in general, to, to close out this slide, I, from what I've seen, communication is the answer there. And it can sometimes feel really awkward to bring up this kind of a conversation. Here in the United States, we just don't talk about money very much. Uh, and, and it can feel like, hey, I want to keep this closed. Uh, I, I'll make the decisions and then somebody will handle it someday, but especially with the person you're naming as you're an executor, or if you've been named in as, as an executor for someone else and you need to learn what's involved, communication is going to be the answer to that, building bridges and kind of saying, all right, well, if I'm going to be an executor, can you help me understand what are the assets at play? And we're going to help you understand that today with uh, some of the topics, all right? So, Elena, can you help us understand, though, what's this difference between an executor and a trustee? Yeah, of course. So an executor is someone that's appointed under your will. And the laws that control the executor, the details, those are all very state specific. However, the goal of an executor in every state is to deliver the assets from the decedent to, how, to where they've been disposed of under the will. So that could be to kids, that could be to charities, Whoever that person decided, yes, this is who I want to receive my assets at my death. And the will controls those assets and the executor makes that happen. So generally, the first step that the executor will take will be to file the will with the local probate court. That probate court then issues some sort of authoritative document that gives the executor the legal access to the decedent's assets. They then start collecting those assets, um, moving accounts into an estate account, um, accessing anything that had a TOD to the estate that named the estate as a beneficiary. However, they need to, to access the various assets of the decedent. The next step in most states that the executor must take is to notify any creditors of the decedent and any, um, excuse me, you notify your creditors and anyone that owes that decedent money. You know, it's their job to make sure that the estate receives any benefit that was owed to the individual. They also pay any final taxes, pay any final debts, 
and then administrative expenses, such as legal fees, CPA things, things like that. Once all of the assets have been collected, all of the debts have been paid off, that's when distributions can be made to the beneficiaries under the will. They do also have to take in mind, never forget that decedent had a final income tax return. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they'll pay any estate taxes that are due and file any estate tax returns. The executor role is relatively short. Hopefully the executor opens the estate, collects the assets, pays the debts, distributes the assets, and closes the estate. However, that can take some time, especially if there are, you know, harder assets, real estate that has to be sold. Um, anytime that family conflict arises, the executor will be in that position a little bit longer. And usually the longer an estate is open, the more expensive it is to maintain it, which is why, you know, when we talk about getting your estate planning done, making sure that everything lines up, it's to keep that process for the executor as simple and as easy as possible. So the other thing to note too, is that the executor is just going to be in charge of probate assets. Those are assets that you have in your name at your death that do not have any joint owner, that do not have any beneficiary designation, and that do not have a TOD, a transfer on death, or a POD, a payable on death. An executor, unless that entity has named the estate as that POD, TOD, the executor will not be able to access those assets. So you'll see in the graph that we, he that we have here, Assets that are owned by joint tenancy, for example, real estate or joint brokerage account, those typically pass by something called rights of survivorship. A lot of times a married couple will own their assets as joint tenants with rights of survivorship, and that avoids probate at the death of the first of them. It does not avoid probate at the death of the second of them, or if something were to happen, to them simultaneously, for example, a car accident. At that point, that's when the wills would kick in and the executor would be appointed to access that asset. Looking at the next sort of little graph here, you'll see how we have property in the individual's name and the decedent, the person that passed away. Their assets pass under the last will and testament and they go through probate. Eventually after the probate process, they'll pass to the designated heirs or beneficiaries of the will. Assets that don't or that do have that beneficiary designation on them, they will pass automatically, usually with a death certificate, to whoever is named as the beneficiary. A lot of times life insurance and retirement accounts have those beneficiaries named. So, Elena, if I have named uh, beneficiaries in my IRA, but then I make a change to my will afterwards, mm -hmm. does that supersede the the, uh, the beneficiaries that I've got indicated in my IRA? No, it does not. So if you are updating your will, you know, if you're making any sort of you're creating testamentary trust or you want a beneficiary to receive that IRA, for example, you can write that down in your will. But if that beneficiary is not named on the beneficiary designation, then the will has no control over it. So your executor is a little bit different than your trustee. You know, I'm in Georgia. I practice in Georgia. We are generally a probate friendly, a probate -friendly state. Uh, we don't try to avoid probate, but that is not the case in a lot of places around the country. Again, because trust in the states, it's very state-based. There's a lot of state particular rules. Just as and an so, example, you know, we want to avoid that in Virginia where I am. We, we want to avoid probate. It's, it could be nine to 12 months in the state of Virginia to go through a probate process. Exactly, and like I said, you know, the longer you're going through probate, the more expensive it is for the estate. The more help that the executor needs, it gets to be more and more expensive. So you try to limit that. And one of the ways that you can do that is with a revocable living trust. So whereas the executor has to work with the court 
to be appointed as executor. The revocable living trust names a successor trustee who will step in to the decedent's shoes to manage assets right away. And that can be a big benefit to that estate. You know, there's no court involvement. Um, they have the ability to operate a sort of administrative trust, kind of like what's in the probate period, but it's all done in trust. And then they do the same role. They start collecting all of the trust assets. If there's anything that they didn't have access to as the trustee before, um, they pay the debts, they collect anything that's owed to the decedent, and then they make distributions to the beneficiaries, the same as the executor would. So they're, 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 they're similar roles. They've got the same goal at the end of the day, collect the assets, distribute them. The one big difference though, is that a revocable trust has to be funded during your lifetime. And what that means is that your assets need to be put into that trust in order to avoid probate. Because a trust, unlike a person, never passes away. So those assets can be automatically transferred to the successor trustee without having to go through probate. If you do, however, have a trust that doesn't get fully funded during lifetime, you know, let's say the decedent, the person that passed away, inherited property 20 years ago in a different state, and they forgot about it. They never did the deed, never did anything like that. There's usually always something called a pour over will that makes sure that the assets, they do have to go through probate, but that they end up in the revocable trust and can pass simultaneously. So it's a good process. It doesn't avoid probate unless the trust is fully funded, but the roles of the trustee and the executor are pretty similar. It's just their ease of getting to access the assets. There is, so however- have, uh, Today, Elena, people who are participating who are already serving in the role of executor, but we have a lot of people who are contemplating being an, an executor someday. And one of the things I'm hearing you say is doing a dry run and kind of saying, well, let's see if I was an executor, where the assets are, what they are, compiling a list of what those assets are in one place, figuring out how they are titled right now could maybe save a lot of heartache later on. That 100%. So getting that list of assets together is one of the biggest steps that you can take as part of your estate planning process. Because, you know, it may be simple. You and your spouse, you know everything that the two of you have. You know where things can be located. You know who to call. But your kids might not have that information, especially if they're younger. If you choose non-family members to be your executor, to be your trustee, they're not going to have any idea where your assets are at. And so even if you take the step this year while you're updating your documents or you're looking back at what you've previously done, start compiling that list of your assets and look and see, do I have a revocable trust? Do I need to move the title, move the ownership of these assets into that trust? Or is it going to be okay going through probate? And so that's one of the best things that you can do to help prepare your executor and trustee. Great. That's great. Yeah, so so now we have to figure out, well, in the process of preparing this estate plan, what do we need to have gathered together? And I'll start talking about two different powers of attorney that, that we can give. And a power of attorney just means I authorize someone to act on my behalf. But the, the, the number one, and this is actually a pre-death document. This is not something that comes into place as, as part of an executor or a post-death trustee. This is something that you have to allow people to transact on your behalf financially while you're living, but incapacitated. And so a power of attorney for property is, is, is built as something that's called a durable power of attorney, meaning it lives beyond my incapacitation. Uh, it effectively, it can be effective immediately. So it means right now I have already named someone as my power of attorney. That's a place, remember, to, to, to keep in mind, if you've named someone as your current power of attorney, they have a lot of power. They can enter into a loan on your behalf. They can sell property or buy property on your behalf without you knowing. So it's a very powerful document. But it's an important document to have in the event of your incapacitation in particular because, for example, uh, if, if you have a retirement plan, 
uh, and you don't have a power of attorney, and you, the, someone needs to take distributions from that retirement plan on your behalf, they're going to need to get a court order if there's not a power of attorney in place. If the power of attorney is in place, you need to have specifically listed in there, my power of attorney can transact on my retirement plans and uh, IRAs. If you don't, again, you can run into difficulty. So this is one of the reasons why it's a good idea to work with a professional estate attorney. They do it full time. They've seen this movie many times before, and they include all the appropriate language that needs to be in there, as opposed to an attorney who practices in multiple areas or working with someone online. From our experience, it's great to work with a professional. As Elena said, there's going to be cost as part of administering an estate afterward. That cost can be reduced substantially by doing proper document planning in advance. The last thing I mentioned on the power of attorney for property is that you want it to include digital asset authority these days. So it, let's say that you haven't updated your estate plan in 20 years, even 15 years. Uh, it's probably not going to mention anything about digital asset authority. What is that? Well, being able to log into your Facebook or LinkedIn or, or, or Instagram account or whatever social media you happen to use. You can have a document that allows someone to, to gain access to that by presenting a power of attorney properly to, to uh, whatever company. The other power of attorney we're going to talk about is uh, for healthcare. So each power of attorney document is going to specify, here's the ways this person can make decisions on my behalf. This second power of attorney is going to be limited to my health. All right. If I am in a position where I cannot make decisions on my own for my health, I need someone else to be able to make decisions for me. And, and so I create a power of attorney for healthcare that says, okay. here's the person I name who can make medical decisions on my behalf. I also include with it an advanced directive. The advanced directive says, hey, uh, if these contemplated situations happen, here's what I want done. If I'm in a persistent vegetative state with no hope of recovery, either I want to be kept alive no matter what, or I want a uh, uh, means of you know, sustenance uh, taken away, that's all designated, pre-designated. So the, the, the last thing I'd say about these powers of attorney is we want these to be as flexible as possible. This is gonna be true with an executor and, uh, and trustee role as well. If I only name one individual and that individual happens to be you know, on, on a trip with their family in Japan, right? And nobody can now transact because the person I'm named is unavailable. Uh, I'd really rather have three people named in succession who can make these decisions on my behalf. Sometimes I get a question at this point of, well, what if I name my children all together? And, and the danger in naming multiple people at, at contemporaneously is that now you need multiple signatures to get anything done. And even more importantly than that, you need a complete agreement between individuals on how something should be done. So typically it's better to name people in succession, not in tandem. So then we have the other two documents that are we've already somewhat discussed is a last will and testament and a revocable living trust. As we said, anything that is mentioned in the will that is not titled to a retirement plan, life insurance policy, uh, uh, or, or, or some joint form of ownership or transfer on death provision already added, that's going to be the probate estate. That's what the will covers. All right. Two other things that a will can do that nothing else can do. It names an executor. Nothing else can. If you don't name an executor, and I was reading an article today that said, you know, we, we have a big problem in this in the country. One of three people in our country have drafted an estate plan. It gets a little bit better for those over 55. It's about one in two. But we're talking about a lot of estates that have problems after death because before they can do anything, they need to go to a court to petition to even just have an executor assigned. You have the will, the executor is assigned. And the other reason you have a will is to nominate guardians for minor children. There's no other document can do that. And I typically tell my clients the worst decision that you could choose is probably better than the best decision the state's going to choose on your behalf. So get that named written in, in stone. The other you know, thing I'll mention, who needs an estate plan? You know, I had a, a, an 18-year-old freshman who had appendicitis and we couldn't uh, get information from the doctors about her care because she hadn't had a power of attorney yet. Who knew? And uh, HIPAA laws in the United States made it so that her her care was private to her. And we needed you know, to go through some hoops to get some information about what was going on with her. Everybody needs an estate plan. Uh, the last document, which I think we've covered pretty fully, is a revocable living trust. This is, the one thing I'll say is that this is still like it's you, OK? You, you don't have to file a different tax return. 
you don't you you probably have to create a new investment account or a new bank account to title to that trust but it still flows through to your own personal tax return you have complete control over it you can amend it at any time you can even defund it if you say never mind i don't want a rev revocable trust transfer it all back into your own name has a lot of flexibility to this document but but uh it is the document that is going to allow you for certain assets to avoid probate. So then we have to decide, and this is, man, one of my favorite charts that we prepared at Savant. So, uh, but, but Elena, it's, it's, it's a little bit, looks like a pretty complex board here. Can you walk us through how we uh, figure out beneficiary and asset titling decisions? Yeah, definitely. So y'all will see here that client one and client two living trust. That's a joint trust that's been established by a married couple. Uh, they created it back in 2013, and then they restated the trust agreement in 2020. So far during their lives, they've moved their home into the trust, and they've opened a trust bank account. And so what that means is that those two assets will most definitely go into the spousal subtrust which are created at the death of the first spouse. However, when you're looking at titling, you'll see that these clients have a bunch of other assets. They don't just have their investment account in home. They've also got a bank account and they've also got a bonds account. So those are currently titled jointly, which is great if one of them were to predecease the other. However, again, if something were to happen to them simultaneously, it would be better for those assets to be owned by the joint trust or to at least be TOD'd into that trust because you don't ever want to have those assets going through probate if you can avoid it. You've also got the assets that are passing via beneficiary. So you've got client one's IRA and their Roth IRA and clients two IRA. You'll see on our chart here that we've listed the beneficiaries, again, because this is very important to determine who those beneficiaries are going to be, to see if those assets align with your overall estate plan. If you've named client two as the beneficiary of client one's IRA, you know, that's fine. That means that the spouse is going to have access to that account outright. What that doesn't mean is that that asset is going to fund those spousal trusts. And this is a pretty this is a pretty complicated plan. These clients were definitely doing some tax planning when it came to creating these spousal trusts. Uh, they've also created lifetime trusts for their kids, which is good. These are all things that need to be taken into consideration um, when it comes to creating your own estate plan. You'll see certain other assets, for example, client one's life insurance, that has an outright beneficiary as well. And then there is a DAF or the um, donor advised fund, which that doesn't get moved into a trust. Those IRAs, you know, one thing too that I want to mention is that those IRAs, those retirement accounts, those cannot be owned by a revocable trust joint or individual. Those have to stay in the original owner's name in order to continue receiving their tax benefits. So I think if we go to the next slide, Joel, you'll see that we do have options when it comes to changing those beneficiaries. You can do what they've done. You can name your spouse outright. You can name your spousal trust. And you can name your children or charity, you know, whoever you want to have. But there are, there's a lot of intricate details that you need to think about when naming these beneficiaries to make sure that they align with your overall estate plan. And then something important just to think about since the SECURE Act, which came out a few years ago, is if you do want to leave your IRA assets to your heirs, Joel is going to tell you about that. Yeah, so... It used to be pretty straightforward, actually, to leave uh, IRS to our heirs. It was a very tax efficient method. If I left it to my spouse, my spouse could take the assets out over from the IRA over their whole life expectancy. If I left it to my children, my children could take it out over their entire life expectancy. It was called a stretch IRA. You may remember that a few years ago, they moved the required distribution age from 70 and a half to 72. They've since moved it to 73. But that first change from 70 and a half to 72 
The way they funded that to preserve tax neutrality was they said all of these uh, certain class of heirs are going to have to take the entire amount out of the IRA in 10 years. So for some, that's not an issue, right? If we have uh, uh, five heirs of a $500,000 IRA, $100,000 received, take that $100,000 out over 10 years, that's not going to create necessarily a tax issue. Same situation, one child, $500,000 IRA, the one child receives $500,000, and now we, we're going to have some tax management to do. As a result, what we've really pushed toward here is thinking of, hey, let's be very careful about which assets we leave to whom. I want to start by saying, well, who do I want to get my assets on my death? Make a list. And then let's say a charity is in that list. Well, the charity should be the recipient of the IRA, right? I should list the charity as one of my beneficiaries of my IRA. Why is that? Because when the charity receives it, they don't pay income taxes. And now my heirs have received it and they, they, they would have had to pay income taxes if they got it. So instead of leaving my heirs another asset like my house or uh, like my investment account, that everything received a, a step up in basis at death. And this is another important issue to make sure that you're covering if you are an executor or a trustee, that the institutions involved are doing a step up in basis or on real property that you're getting an appraisal for the property to say, here's what this property was worth as of someone's date of death. Why is that important? Because in the United States, if I die holding property highly appreciated, it no longer matters what I paid for that property. What matters is what it was worth as of my date of death. When I leave it to my heirs, that's the basis upon which tax future in the future will be calculated when they sell it. So very different to leave a real property or an investment account, stocks, mutual funds, anything like that to an heir in a, a taxable account as opposed to in an IRA. So we want to use uh, uh, the IRA for any charitable giving, right, at, 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 to start with. So if I leave my IRA asset to beneficiaries outright, there's not much complexity. However, I have to remember, I now don't have asset protection, right? In certain situations, like if I have a child who's special needs and needs to keep under a certain level of income to qualify for government aid, I can run into a real problem if I name them as an outright beneficiary of an IRA. Uh, but it does certainly create more simplicity. If I leave it in a trust, there's definitely greater asset protection. Let's say I'm concerned about the spouse of my child, and I, I'm not sure that marriage is gonna last, and I don't want them getting access to those assets, uh, that can be a situation where I lean more towards, all right, I get complexity in a trust, but I can protect and limit the assets better, okay? So when do you leave it in a trust? It, 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 it's, if you have a substantial IRA in the hands of a beneficiary and you're concerned about their age or their financial acumen, uh, or you know their, their their physical limitations, that's probably where you'd lean towards a trust. Then there's language. This is another reason why estate plans need to be looked at right now because there's legacy language from prior to this IRA change that could need a, a, a good refresh. All right. And again, if you're managing an estate right now, you don't get this option as the current executor. But if you're contemplating a future executor, or if you're going to be an executor and you're looking at someone else's estate that you might have to manage someday, you would look at something like, well, am I, do I have a conduit trust or do I have an accumulation trust? A conduit trust, IRA withdrawals have to be distributed to the beneficiary. So I leave the IRA to the conduit trust every year, the money goes out and is subject to income taxes by the beneficiary, but they receive it all. In an accumulation trust, I make a withdrawal from the IRA, but I put it in another trust account. I accumulate the money in the trust and the trust pays the taxes. Now you could say, well, that sounds like pretty preferable, right? Because I still have, I have a lot more control there. The sacrifice you're giving in terms of that greater control is that now when it's retained by the trust, trusts have a very different tax system. They have the same rates that we all have, except they reach the 37% bracket at around $20,000. So as soon as you've got more than $20,000 of income in a trust, that every additional dollar is being taxed at 37% federally. So we have tax, uh, 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 we, like I said at the beginning, we've got a balancing act, right, between competing priorities. But this is definitely a reason why if an estate plan has not been looked at in 10 years, it's really important to, to do a refresh, okay?
So now let's get to if, if I'm the executor uh, and I am going to have responsibilities, what are the dates I need to keep in mind for uh, uh, documents that need to be filed? Can you help us with that, Elena? Of course I can, because I have advised many an executor on those deadlines. And, you know, even after death, the tax collector still comes for us all, but it's in your executor's control. And so the first deadline that any executor needs to be aware of is the decedent's income tax return. And so that's going to be due on April 15th of the year following death. So if someone were to pass away in 2024, that income tax return is still going to be due on April 15th of next year. You can, same as anyone else, file an extension to October 15th. That also applies to any estate income. So let's say that an estate is open for a few years and the assets that are under the executor's control have generated sufficient income that an estate income tax is, is required. You've also got until that April 15th deadline. Same goes for a trust. If you have to open an administrative trust, if you have an irrevocable trust that's filing its own trust returns, April 15th is the big one. However, in a state tax, and this is a death tax, this is an amount that's subject to the decedent's wealth. So right now, there is an available estate tax exemption amount of $13.61 million. So that means to have to file an estate tax return and to pay estate taxes, your estate would have to uh, would have to be worth more than that $13.61 million. That's the federal amount. There are also state estate taxes, so you need to be conscious of that in your own state, and it can affect your affect your planning because those state estate exemption amounts are usually a lot less, but federally above that thirteen point six one million. And so, to file the estate tax return, you have nine months after the date of death with an available six month extension. So it's usually 15 months you have before that estate tax would be would have to be paid. You can also elect between a married couple to port the decedents, the first one to die, their available estate tax exemption over to the surviving spouse. So that surviving spouse, that widow or widower, they could have double the exemption amount. So about 27 million this year. To do that, however, the executor has to make a portability election on a 706 estate tax return. The law recently changed. So now there's five years that the executor has to make that portability election, which is a lot better than it used to be. And it allows for some of these estates that may not have needed double the exemption amount for them to still have access to it. And then, like I said, just to make sure that any state estate tax return is filed as well. And those deadlines will vary based on the state. Excellent. So we're gonna close out here kind of where we started and that's uh, trying to promote, promote family harmony. And I said at the beginning that we that this is really an issue of communication. And, and if at all possible, we do suggest having good intergenerational communication. Now, you could be a parent right now contemplating one of your children being your executor someday or a spouse. You could be one of the children who's thinking about, may, you may need to be that executor and, and contemplating, well, do my parents have everything in line the way it needs to be? One of the great tools out there that we, we, we've created and, and we really hang our hat on it, we're, we're, we're happy to have this is what's called an estate and trust administrator's guide. And if I could summarize what that is, it's kind of the uh, amalgam of all of the different situations that we've heard of somebody dying and not having an answer for, right? Something that wasn't written down that people had to search for. So it's about 12, 13 pages at this point. You're not gonna need to answer all those questions yourself. The, the, some will apply to you and some won't. This is the first page here. You can see, you know, if you've made funeral arrangements, have that listed in one place. If, if you know that you want to be cremated or not, have that listed. If you know where you want your obituary published, have that listed. Things that'll come on later pages are things like name all of your accounts, where they are, 
usernames, passwords, if you want to include that. Uh, life insurance policies, where are those? Long-term care policies, where are those? So that you can get everything in one place that can be a very good administrative document to pair up with that more uh, formal estate plan that you've created, all right? So it's also the place that you're gonna contemplate, hey, do I want what's called an ethical will? And the idea behind an ethical will is just saying, I'm trying to convey my values to the next generation, not just my assets. And sometimes I'm looking to do that by leaving unequal amounts to heirs. I have a child who is a teacher and a child who is a doctor. One is gonna have significantly more needs than the other. And it, it's my choice in the way that I design things that I'd like to leave assets unequally to make sure both children are cared for. You can contemplate some of those questions here, okay? And then it, it's also a place where you can capture who, what are the fiduciaries that I'm choosing to act on my behalf as executors, trustees. Uh, so at the end of the day, I, there's, a, there's a sprays Home Depot ad a number of years ago, you can do it, we can help. And, and one of the things I'd like you to just think of is consider bringing in outside professionals to help walk you through this, that it, this is your first time facing this. And for others, it's not. As an example, for, for, for clients of Savant, we prepare a uh, deceased client checklist in the event of someone passing away that lists all of the responsibilities of what need to be done, what's done by the attorney, what's done by the individual or executor, what's done by Savant, and, and can, can kind of walk through those important steps. So it, it can feel daunting, right, that, that this role, multiple roles, executor, trustee, power of attorney. Uh, so it's great to ask questions. And uh, that, that's really what we wanted to cover today in general. I think we're gonna have some time for questions in a second, but I, I do wanna emphasize if you want help discussing your individual situation, we're gonna post a, a link. Please uh, click on that link to schedule a complimentary consultation if you would like, our team would love to connect with you, okay? But we do have a, a time for a couple questions here. As I said before, post any questions you have to the Q&A window. And if we do not get to them, we're not going to get to them. There's a lot of questions on here today. Uh, we are going to make sure we answer each and every one of them. So we know, you know, you, you've registered with your email address. We'll be able to send an email response back to you uh, based on the questions you have. So the first one I'm going to ask here, though, is, all right, uh, does an executor get paid for their work? Elena, does an executor get paid? So typically, yes, an executor can take a fee for their work as the executor and the same with the trustee. You can, however, in your will, you can say, no, my executor won't be paid. Uh, that is an option under some state's laws. Uh, you can also have a statutory executor's fee. So the law says exactly the executor gets this percentage, this percentage. Um, again, that's something you'll need to figure out with your attorney. I will say, when I was in private practice, I had a lot of executors who declined to take their executor's fee, even when it was available. And one of the reasons for that was because they they were the executor out of a sense of duty. You know, they were doing this for their family, their friends. They saw it as something that they were required to do, not something that they did for money. And so my advice would be, Talk to your executor. If you want them to take their executor's fee, please let them know that. You know, say, hey, I respect your time. I respect what you're doing for me. Please take the executor's fee because a lot of people don't. Great point. Great point. So another question here is, my parent has named me <laughs> as their executor. What information should I ask them for? That's it's, it's great. I, I could actually go back to the slide about the estate and trust administrator's guide. So you could email us and ask for a copy of that and kind of have a conversation with your parent maybe about that. But if we're talking in general about the most critical documents that they give you a copy of if they're willing to, it would be powers of attorney, it would be their will, a trust if they have one. Those are, the, and an advanced medical directive, all right? Those are the four basic estate planning documents. In addition to that, I would say, get you statements, not just handwritten summaries, but a statement from each bank account they have, from each brokerage account they have, from each IRA or retirement plan they have, uh, and every life insurance policy they have. Uh, uh, I'm sure there's going to be accounts that I'm missing in that. So at the end, you just ask them, are there any accounts that we, you know, you hold that we're not aware of yet? This is, I will tell you, one of the, the most time-consuming parts 
of being an executor is not knowing where everything is. And, and even I've seen it happen where a year after someone's passed away, uh, a, a, a tax filing comes, a tax form comes, oh my goodness, they had a Fidelity account, I wasn't aware of it, Here, uh, th there was income paid, what is that account? And, and it's important to then to trace that back. Far better if you handle that in advance. Uh, you know, question. Go ahead, one other me. thing, let me just chime in. The one other thing that I would recommend that you ask for too is your parents' people's names. So their CPA's name, their attorney's name, their financial advisor's name. You know, try to be familiar with the people that your parents are familiar with because those are going to be another good resource of, hey, this is where the assets are. I know what I know why that trust was established. Um, information like that you can gain easily from their people when the time comes. That's a great point. Absolutely. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. I'll throw this in here. Uh, I'm trying to choose who to name as my executor. Any ideas of what traits I should look for in that person? Elena, maybe you can answer that one. I can. So what makes a good executor? is someone that knows when to ask for help. You do not have to pick the smartest person that you know. They should have a little bit of financial savviness. Um, they should get along mostly with all of the beneficiaries of your estate. But really, it's knowing, it's picking someone that's going to know when they have a problem and know who to turn to because that's gonna make it easier for them to settle the estate in the long run. Excellent, I think that's that's a great place to close yeah. it off. You should be looking for good individuals who know where to turn when there's something that they don't know. And and, and that's, that's a, a critical life skill from, from our perspective. And I think one that all of you have demonstrated in coming here today to try and educate yourselves on, on how this process might work. If at any time you're looking for information about Savant, what we do, I invite you to go to savantwealth.com to learn more, or like I said, to schedule that 15 minute complimentary call with us anytime. Thank you for being with us today. Have a great day. Thanks y'all. If you enjoyed this webinar, visit savantwealth.com slash guides and download our complimentary guidebooks, checklists, and other useful financial resources.